tracking the amazing growth of the first century church to challenge and inspire the 21st century church. This is Unstoppable Church, Then and Now, recorded on location in Israel, Cyprus, Turkey, Greece, Malta and Italy. Bible teacher and church pastor Mike Beaumont is in conversation for the next 30 minutes with David Taverner. We've been following the story of Paul very much over these last episodes, Mike. Uh, we're still in Rome, though, and of course we can't leave Rome without talking about Peter. Um, but how is it that you know Paul gets such an amount of column inches, if you like, in, in, in the Acts of the Apostles? <laughs> yeah, he certainly does, doesn't he? Um, the first 12 chapters of Acts we've seen focus very much around Peter and along with him, John and Philip some stories as well but Peter's definitely the focal point isn't he of those early chapters but then chapters 13 to 28 focus almost entirely on Paul whose story we've been following in the last few episodes now why that sort of imbalance well uh, it, it was an inevitable imbalance in some ways because Luke as we've seen was accompanying Paul for many of his journeys and so he had much more first-hand witness there but in no way does he try to elevate Paul above Peter in fact he seems to go out of his way to show similar stories happening about both of them so these are two definitely two pillars that the church was built on it's just that he spent more time with one of them than the other now I said Peter here we are in Rome and there's a band playing in the background. You probably ought to explain where we are in Rome. Yeah, we're in the great square outside St. Peter's Basilica, which is one of the iconic sites, isn't it, to visit if you come here to Rome. And uh, yeah, we're sitting in the shade in one of the sort of curved porticos that reach out from the basilica. And those curved porticos were designed to represent like arms reaching out to the whole world and the great church that we've just been inside and, and looked around and it's fabulous building I suppose it's the sort of building you you're going to love or hate depending on your church background but there's some beautiful things inside and it's it's built on the site of a basilica that was established there in the fourth century uh, built by the Emperor Constantine and when Constantine became a Christian uh, Christianity became a, a permitted religion and uh, religious shrines and sites and basilicas started popping up all over the place where Christians had been meeting for a long time but just hadn't been able to mark that in a public way. So there's a tradition that this is the place where Peter was buried uh, in the 16th century. Michelangelo, the well-known sculptor, was very involved in designing this new basilica and decor. And it's a really impressive church, a, a nave that's 610 feet long, 15 storeys high, total area of the basilica. I've got to read this, 535,400 square feet or 12 acres with a magnificent dome, 138 feet in diameter. So an amazing building and all going back to the fact that this is believed to be the place where Peter was buried. Now, is it? Well, back in the 1930s, an ancient Roman necropolis was found here, uh, right under the basilica, containing what since archaeologists and scholars, both of a Christian and non-Christian background, do believe could well be um, the tomb of St. Peter. And for some, definitely is the tomb of St. Peter and you can see it it's in front of the altar there's this sort of semicircular space at the level of the grottos down below in an area called the confessio confessio latin for confession and it refers to the confession of faith that Peter made that led to his martyrdom so an absolutely amazing place that we're sitting that yeah takes us in the direction of Peter and his story. I mean, certainly the decor, the, the gold, the scale of the basilica, you know, is 
a very strange contrast to Peter the Fisherman that we think of going <laughs> right back to the beginning. Yeah, I don't think you can help but not notice that contrast. Uh, Peter, who grew up alongside the Sea of Galilee, spent his early years fishing there, then followed Jesus. No home for them, really, no permanent base for them for the three years. And then beginning his ministry for Jesus and starting to travel, seems initially he was based very much in Jerusalem and Judea, uh, and then traveled beyond that. But this is, I mean, this couldn't be further away. And I was thinking that myself as we walked there with all the, the gold and the beautiful carvings that are in there, that are all obviously done out of um, respect and faith, um, not just for Peter, of course, but for the Lord Jesus to whom the whole church is dedicated. But as I said, it's, it's the sort of thing that you either get or you don't faith-wise. And for some people, this will be a real turn-off. For others, it will be a wow. Look at what people have invested to, to honour God and the Lord Jesus and to remember the story of Peter here. But it is, without a doubt, a huge, huge contrast. I've got to ask you then, you know, the Pope would, of course, appear on the balcony famously, and, uh, you know, here we are in Vatican City. What's that connection with Peter the Fisherman and the Popes of now? Well, it is a Catholic tradition, and one that it would be good perhaps just to look at for a moment, because uh, even if our listeners aren't Catholic, it's good for them to understand why people hold this particular tradition. And... For Catholics, it goes right back to Matthew chapter 16, where Jesus promised Peter that he would be the rock on which the church would be established. Now, we've called this episode established because we do believe the church is established. On Peter, well, that's a question mark, but on all who confess Christ, absolutely. But why don't we just go back and read that really important story? In Matthew 16, 13, we read this, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the son of man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. So does an interpretation or understanding of that verse hang on one word? <laughs> well, yeah. You see, some people there think that when Jesus said, uh, you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church, how do we interpret this rock? Well... I'm not a Roman Catholic by background, but I have to say, I think textually, the rock he has in mind there is Peter himself. And I think it's probably less than honest to acknowledge that. And there's a play on words there in the Greek. Um, Peter, Petros, rock, Petra. You're Petros, but I'm gonna make you a Petra for my whole church. So it looks like Jesus is saying there that Peter will be the rock that he will build the church on. Now, many Protestants not wanting to take that line see the rock there as the confession of Peter when he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And there is absolutely no doubt that it's that confession, whether it's from Peter's lips or from our lips, that is the foundation of the church till today. It's where people make that confession that the church is established and built. So these are the two options. Um, is the rock Peter or is the rock the confession? Well, Roman Catholics would say it was Peter. 
And then from that, because Jesus goes on to say, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom, uh, they take that to mean that Jesus was inaugurating Peter as the first pope and that he had the right and the ability, therefore, to pass those keys on in what we now call apostolic succession. Uh, Protestants would see that somewhat differently. Keys of the kingdom of heaven in Jewish thinking uh, wasn't about getting into heaven. It was often about being forgiven and being able to pronounce forgiveness. So there are two quite different ways of, of understanding that that still impact the church and its major divisions today. So this is where the popes of today would pronounce their blessing? Yeah, absolutely, because um, right alongside the Basilica here are the Vatican buildings where the Pope and the whole Curia live and there's a little balcony just to the right of the main entrance where the Pope comes out to pronounce his blessings on those who gather in the square and who see him on TV, obviously. I mean, this square is enormous. Perhaps we should say it, it can hold 300,000 people. Now, um, that is huge and he will you know, come from there uh, as Peter's successor in Catholic thinking to pronounce blessing on all those who make this confession. And I think what is worth saying here is that actually um, it, it's Christ and the confession of Christ ultimately that the church is established upon rather than any one man or one person, whether that's then uh, or now. But wherever anyone will confess the name of Jesus and say, yeah, I've seen it in the face of all the alternatives and there were many at Caesarea Philippi, I'm confessing that you're the Christ, the son of the living God, and I intend to live my life now in a way that pleases you, honors you, that follows you, that puts you first, that does what you say. And where you see people making that confession, the church is established and it becomes the theme of this series, Unstoppable Church. I was gonna say, let's go back to the Peter in the Bible and as we hear a little more about how he played his part in the Unstoppable Church, um, what would you want to highlight? Well, you know, if we go back, we've said that his story takes up, you know, the first 12 chapters or so, but, but what then? Well, clearly, while Peter did reach out to Gentiles, think of how we've seen in a previous episode, his reaching out to the household of Cornelius, very significant. But his primary calling does seem to have been to the Jews while Paul reached out to the Gentiles. And in fact, they had a meeting where they agreed that. And we can read about that in Galatians 2, uh, 6 to 10, where we read these words. This is Paul writing, As for those who seem to be important, whatever they were makes no difference to me, for God does not judge by external appearance. Those men added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they saw that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, just as Peter had been to the Jews. For God, who was at work in the ministry of Peter as an apostle to the Jews, was also at work in my ministry as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Peter and John, those reputed to be pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the Jews. All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. Now that was a meeting 14 years after Paul's conversion, so their ministries are obviously getting fairly well developed. And up to that point, we can see that Peter has been ministering uh, primarily among the Jews. Now, where have we seen him in our story in Acts? Well, quick recap, we've seen him at the Ascension, we've seen him in that waiting prayer meeting, we've seen him at Pentecost, in the temple, when he healed the lame beggar, then before the Sanhedrin, when they got in trouble for healing the beggar. We've seen him in the story of Ananias and Sapphira, that very um, startling story. In Samaria, when he went down to see what was happening with the Gentiles there. Uh, in Lydda, when he prayed for Dorcas to be raised from the dead. In Joppa, when he went to the house of Simon the Tanner, where he had that vision that eventually took him 
to Caesarea and to the household of Cornelius. And then we see him next at the Council of Jerusalem in AD 49 in, in chapter 15. So we've seen quite a bit of him doing exactly what we've seen was agreed there, him taking the gospel to primarily the Jews. But obviously there's a little bit more to the story than that because how did someone who was preaching the gospel to the Jews end up here uh, buried in Rome? Indeed. Well, although, you know, he did preach primarily to the Jews, he did end up preaching to the Gentiles as well. Now, all we can do is piece together a few bits of jigsaw and they don't actually fit together perfectly, but we can put them down in the picture and sort of perhaps work out the picture that would fill in in between. So what have we got? What's the data? Well, we last met him in Acts in chapter 12. Do you remember that miraculous rescue yeah. from jail? And that story ended up with us being told that he left for another place. Very enigmatic, mm. but we aren't told where. We have no idea where Peter went, but he went to another place. It seems he went out of that area. Okay, what else do we know? We know from Galatians 2 that we've just read, he definitely visited Antioch for that meeting with Paul. He may have visited Corinth because he's referred to in 1 Corinthians 1. He was certainly closely associated with those Christians of Northern Asia Minor. And his first letter, 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, uh, is addressed to scattered Christians in those areas of Asia Minor. So he must have had some connection with them there, uh, which might be, by the way, why the Holy Spirit resisted Paul going in that direction, because Peter had already worked there. Uh, yeah, so that was sort of God having the bigger picture and avoiding duplication. Yeah, aren't you glad that God has the bigger picture? You know, and sometimes we get frustrated, and I suspect Paul got frustrated uh, on those days when he couldn't go where he wanted to. But hey, God knew what he was doing. It was like, you know, we've got work going on there, Paul, that you don't know about at the moment. You go this way instead. And off he led him to Europe, didn't he? Well, look, somehow or other, he seems to get from Palestine to those churches of Asia Minor, modern Turkey, and somehow he finally ends up here in Rome. We don't know how, but we do know he, he ends up here because he makes a cryptic reference to it at the end of his first letter. In 1 Peter 5.13, when he's doing the you know, everybody sends their love uh, type bit at the end. <laughs> he says, she who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings, and so does my son, Mark. Babylon. A couple of interesting things there. Babylon, yeah, absolutely not the Babylon of the Old Testament. That was a really insignificant place by this time. But Babylon seems to be used, for example, in the book of Revelation, as a symbol, picture language, for Rome, the place where power was held and abused, just as it had been in Old Testament times in Babylon. So there's a little hint from his own hand that he ended up here in Babylon, and so does my son Mark. Ah, mm. the John Mark, whom we've met earlier, who went off with Barnabas when Barnabas and Paul had a blazing row. And, and the mark of Mark's gospel. And the, the author of Mark's gospel. So he will end up here somehow also, become associated with Peter, go around with Peter, listen to Peter's stories, and gradually write up those stories into what we now call Mark's gospel. How do we know that? One very early tradition um, tells us that Mark recorded what Peter recalled of Jesus's life and ministry. Um, secondly, when we look at the speeches in the book of Acts that Peter makes, they reflect very much um, the pattern that we also see in Peter's letter. So there's lots of things there that, that give us little hints that he ended up here and he ended up here with Mark. 
So, do you know what? That's not a lot of jigsaw pieces on the table, is it? We've got a lot in Judea, Palestine. We've got a couple as he goes up into Gentile territory. Then we can drop a piece or two in Asia Minor, Turkey, where he clearly had oversight for a number of churches there and rights to them. Uh, and then suddenly we've got a great big piece here in Rome. And um, the honest truth is we just don't know how the link was formed between those different places. But I do think if the story of the unstoppable church is like a tapestry, then Peter's involvement is like a thread going in and out. Yeah, absolutely. That's a lovely way to see it. And, you know, still today, we do not have to be kingpin all the time. You know, we do not have to be number one position for God to be able to use us. You know, there are sadly some Christians today, aren't they, who think the world revolves around them and wants the whole attention uh, to be on them. But clearly here, Peter didn't, despite all that Jesus had promised him. Think of Barnabas, a guy who was really ready to be the number two at times to, to Paul, even though he started out as the number one. So, you know, it, it, it doesn't matter who's in the spotlight at any particular time. What matters is that we are working together, that Paul and Peter were working together, like we saw in Galatians 2. They'd agreed to sort of different spheres of ministry to, together in order not to duplicate needlessly the work of, of the Lord Jesus. So it is a tapestry. It does keep popping up, just like some others do, you know, people like Lydia, Priscilla and Aquila, Barnabas. Thank God for these people who pop up in the tapestry and who allow God to weave them in without always wanting to be the big shot number one. And you've referenced Peter's letter. There's, uh, what, how many? Two, two letters from Peter. Uh, what, what do they tell us? What are the thrusts of the message for, from those letters? Yeah, well, we can just turn to those now, and I'm not sure whether our uh, listeners will also be able to hear the, uh, the band that's going by as well. We've got this fantastic sort of papal band behind with everyone dressed up and, and people parading behind. We're not quite sure what it is. But um, it's certainly absolutely splendid and brings home the sort of joyous nature of what goes on here. So, yeah, let's look at those letters. Um, 1 Peter and 2 Peter. 1 Peter, probably written early AD 60s, as things started heating up a bit here under the mad emperor Nero, who started turning against Christians. He blamed Christians for uh, the great fire of Rome, of course. So much of what he does in 1 Peter is to help keep them focused on who they are, because that's so important. You know, when the pressure is on, it's so important. You know that you are established in Christ, that you are rooted in Christ, that your church is established in Christ, not in the latest trend or the latest big figure. And so, uh, really, the whole of 1 Peter is very much a pastor's letter. I mean, if you want to see a pastor's heart, read, uh, read 1 and 2 Peter, because he's got this huge pastoral heart here, and he, he writes to them and reminds them of the... Uh, I'll, in fact, I'll read it. It's so good, the first few verses. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy... He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. He doesn't mince his words. Oh, but isn't that powerful? Yeah. Isn't it encouraging? And why? Because in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. So that reflects something of what was going on here. And he'll go on to say that, hey, listen, what do trials do? They refine your faith. They make you stronger in Jesus. They make you more established in Jesus. I love 1 Peter. It's got, you know, some of my favorite passages in it. One of the others is in uh, chapter 2, where again he's reminding them how established they are in Christ. I'll read those verses, 1 Peter 2, 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, 
that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So an encouragement there of how established they are. They are the people of God. And they're the people that matter, not this mighty people here in Rome who were ruling the roost and, and throwing their weight around. So hugely encouraging. And one other little passage I'm going to read from 1 Peter 5, which again reflects his pastor's heart to the leaders, he writes, to the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder. Oh, that's interesting. You know, not as the head honcho, not as the pope, as a fellow elder a witness of Christ's sufferings and one who will also share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you're willing as God wants you to be, not greedy for money, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. I mean, what an incredible pastor's heart there and, and an encouragement to the leaders of those churches to whom he was writing to, to be pastors themselves and to care for God's people. His sense of being established himself must have helped him to want to establish others. Oh. Absolutely. And I think, you know, he must have gone back many times to those words of Jesus, um, that you're Peter and on this rock I'll build my church. But I think one of the other things that he went back to often that definitely helped him to know that he was established, established in Christ. You see, because established is, is not about the structures and the organisation and whether you're a big church or a little church or you've got money or not. It's about Christ. It's about being established in him. And there's this fantastic passage at the end of John's Gospel. Now, listeners will perhaps remember that Peter had denied Christ three times before his crucifixion. And he was mortified by that. He just hung his head in shame. He couldn't believe that he'd betrayed Jesus just like Jesus said he was going to do. And so... After the resurrection, Jesus comes and appears to him and gives him a chance to put those denials right, to cancel them out by three confessions of faith and three commissions to go and get on with the work. And uh, let's, let's just read that because this is so powerful about Peter and still so helpful, I think, for us today. John 21, verse 15. This is after the resurrection. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Now, Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth, Peter. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted but when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. And Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said, follow me. Powerful words there of recommissioning after you've messed up. You know, we may have feel we've messed up today uh, don't write yourself off. Get back to Jesus. Confess it to him. Hear his words of forgiveness and recommissioning again. And he's telling you he's got a plan and a purpose for you. Now, the plan and the purpose for Peter 
would bring him here, uh, like it would bring Paul here to Rome. And it would be a plan and a purpose that for him would ultimately, of course, lead to his martyrdom and to his death. He was martyred here under Emperor Nero, um, just as Jesus prophesied in those verses that we've just read. So solemn words, but I'm sure also encouraging words that would keep him established in Jesus and not in his own plans and his own ideas. I suppose at the end of the day, Peter knew that Jesus loved him and that's why he loved Jesus. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't see how you can love Jesus unless you know that he's loved you first because all that you are left with otherwise his effort is trying, you know, he's trying to do right, please God, go to church. But once you know you are loved by Jesus, not because of anything you've done, but because he showed his love at the cross and you've put your faith in him and in that love demonstrated there. Once you know that you are loved, then you can go out and love, which of course is exactly what Peter did after John 21. He would do all those journeys. He'd travel here where we've traveled and many other places in between. And he would want people to know that they too could be established, established in a relationship with God the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ. And it has nothing to do with them. It's got everything to do with Jesus and the cross. And all we need to do is put our faith in him and then commit ourselves to a life of following him. And still today, it's when people do that authentically, truly following him, whatever the cost, that church is truly unstoppable church. Mike Beaumont and David Taverner, traveling from Jerusalem to Rome and beyond to track the amazing growth of the first century church and what that means for the unstoppable church of the 21st century. There are more Bible podcasts from Mike and David on the UCB Player app and major podcast platforms. Check out Jesus Then and Now or Bible Books in 30 Minutes.